Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's session of Revelation verse by verse. As we study Revelation chapter 7 today, let us be encouraged in our time on God's Word. The Bible teaches that any time we spend studying Scripture is time well spent. God's word will not return void. Isaiah 55, 11, God said, So shall my word be, be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. In our previous session, we studied the seven seals judgments with their terrible four horsemen and the terrifying geologic upheavals on earth. Now, the final seventh seal, with the even more terrible seven trumpets, is ready to start. However, something nice is happening. God now calls a brief pause or stop as he seals and prepares protects a special group of people on earth and comforts and welcomes those who arrive in heaven. This chapter of Revelation 7 is called the chapter of mercy. It is between two terrible events, the sixth seal and the seventh seal with its seven trumpets. Actually, we see two groups of people in this chapter. The first group is are, are the event, evangelists, 144,000 of them, preaching all over the world. Secondly, a great multitude of Gentile believers who were martyred and now newly enjoying heavenly bliss. The time period starts like this. After the rapture of the church, the tribulation starts on earth, and there is a great revival on earth. God calls a large group of believers to go all over the world preaching the gospel. They are the 144,000 evangelists. All are Jewish. Every one of them is like a Billy Graham, Billy Graham, filled with the Spirit, preaching with special power and unction, extremely eloquent and with great wisdom and strength. Imagine 100,000 and over Billy Grahams traveling worldwide for at least three and a half years. No wonder the Bible says multitudes would be saved from every kindred, tongues, people, and nations. These 144,000 would be supernaturally protected by God and could not die until their job is done. And in Revelation chapter 14, we see them in heaven. So, they must have evangelized past the middle of the tribulation and well into the second half, called the Great Tribulation, before being martyred by the Antichrist. Now as for the second group, the great multitudes redeemed in heaven, they would all arrive in heaven by the middle of the Great Tribulation. And that, and we are going to see about what they did uh, in chapter in this chapter 7. But surely on earth, even more believers would suffer martyrdom during the second half of the tribulation, and that would be covered in later chapters of Revelation. Today, some Christian cults and even theologians interpret this chapter allegorically and spiritualize it they interpret the 144,000 and the multitudes, the great multitudes, as 
meaning their own cult members, or meaning the Christian church as a whole. However, the church is already raptured. Here in Revelation chapter 7 is another group called the Tribulational Saints. Anyway, let's just read this chapter verse by verse and see what the Bible really says. We may title this chapter as The Sealed Amidst Seven Seals or From Tribulation to Jubilation for Believers or From Judgment for the Ungodly to Protection for the Godly. Now an outline of this chapter. In verses 1 to 3, preparations for the sealing. Verses 4 to 8, the 144,000 witnesses or evangelists, their number, their tribes, their ministries. Thirdly, verses 9 to 17, multitudes are redeemed from the world, their origin, their joyful salvation song in heaven, angelic response, an elder in heaven's question and answer, then their heavenly services and earthly toils and trials, finally, no more tears. This chapter starts with preparation for the sealing of the 144,000, verses 1 to 3. Verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, like that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now the four corners of the world is an idiom meaning universal. There are four quadrants of the campus, or the four directions as we know, north, east, south, and west. The four winds would denote the north wind, the west wind, the south wind, and the east wind. These four powerful angels apparently control worldwide weather patterns. Now in mechanical and structural engineering, it is possible to major in wind engineering and be a wind engineer. In global wind pattern, there are four major kinds of winds. First, the polar high winds, then the westerlies, thirdly, the northeast trade wind, and fourthly, the southeast trade winds. The, cir the circulation of this Earth's atmosphere is really a mighty engine. Driven by energy from the sun, the Earth's rotation, the shape of this planet Earth, and the laws of heat transfer. And the wind changes the pattern of all weather. Winds also made life possible on Earth through the so-called hydrologic cycle which transports waters from the ocean to water the earth inland. The tremendous powers of the wind is displayed in great hurricanes, blizzards, tornadoes, and typhoons. Amazingly, these four angels are able to turn on and off this gigantic atmospheric engine. There would be no wind, no breeze, no waves on the seashore, no cloud movements. Everything would be deadly still. Verse 2 And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Another angel here must be a more powerful angel, bringing a message directly from before God's throne. 
He is flying in from the east. East of where John was is the land of Israel, because God has not forget, forgotten his people, the Jews. The seal is a special signet ring where kings and important officials use such rings to stamp into wax on documents or other items. It indicates authenticity, ownership, and guarantees protection. Here is the seal of the living God. In contrast to the dead idols worshipped on earth by unbelievers, the eternal God guarantees that what he had promised in the Bible, he will fulfill. And this angel cried with a loud voice to the four angels. Amazingly here, we see one angel shouting to another angel with a loud voice to do or not to do something. First, we must realize that angels are not gods. They are not omnipresent or everywhere present like God. So even though they are spirit beings, they must still traverse the distance. They must cover the distances fast. They must fly from one point of the universe to another. Secondly, they are very smart and wise, but they are not omniscient or all-knowing like God. So they must talk and discuss matters with one another. There might actually be in heaven a heavenly Bible study for angels. In 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, verse 12, when dealing with prophecy, Peter, Peter the writer, mentioned that which things the angels desire to look into. So, angels also like to study prophecy, Bible prophecy, like what we are doing today. But we mortals should not pray to angels. Angels only listen to God. They are God's servants, not ours. We pray to God in Jesus' name, and God sends angels to help us. So don't talk to angels or worship angels. It may boomerang and they fly away. Verse 3. Hurt not the earth, says that strong angel to the four angels, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The original four angels were ready to hurt the earth, the sea, and the trees. Three observations here. First, the destruction of the land, sea, and trees are all in the next seven trumpet judgments. So, telling these four angels to pause, doing their job, is correct here. Secondly, in the phrase, the servants of our God, the word servant is a special word called doulos in the Greek. This word is not just a servant, it is a slave. A slave who decided to not go free during Jubilee year because he loves his master and continues to serve him. Imagine 144,000 doulos servants of God who are so dedicated on earth they double enlisted in God's services. Nothing now could stop them. Now, the third observation is what kind of seal is that? Can we know who has been sealed? Maybe it would be much like Moses when the Israelites saw him coming down from Mount Sinai after he had communed with God forty days and forty nights, there was a glow on his face. There was an unction about him, and his face 
reflected God's glory. Now let's study in detail the 144,000 in verses 4 to 8. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. The number 144,000 is significant because 144 is 12 times 12 times 1,000. In the Bible, 12 is associated with Israel. There are the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate, meaning for Israel, remembering Israel, the 12 loaves of bread, of showbread in the tabernacle, the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, the 12 thrones for the 12 apostles who will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Now why did God select only Jews as his end time witnesses? In Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abraham, to leave Babylon, Babylonia, and go to the promised land, Canaan, God intended for Israel to shine out as a light to the nations. That's why the promised land of Canaan is located at the center of the most populated part of the earth, Asia, Africa, and Europe, at the center of the three continents. Now, at the end of the age, God is miraculously using Jewish evangelists to spearhead the final spiritual revival on earth before Jesus comes again. Verses 5 to 8 list down the 12 tribes. Verse 5 of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gath were sealed 12,000. And so on the 12 tribes to the end of verse 8. Here are listed the 12 tribal names from each of which God selected 12,000 persons. Notice that the 12, 144,000 are all Jews. Even their 12 tribes are listed. But in the list, there are two missing tribes. The tribes of Dan and Ephraim. And also the order is different from the Old Testament order. We don't know why, only God knows the reason. But here is the history. In the Old Testament, there were exactly 12 tribes all the time. But because Joseph in Egypt was so beloved and popular as ru ruler of Egypt, his two sons, Joseph's two sons, were adopted by grandfather Jacob to be equal to two tribes. That made it 13 tribes. However, Levi, the tribe of Levi, was omitted in the count because the Levites was considered a special priestly tribe with God as its earthly inheritance. They were not given inheritance in the promised land, just tribal cities to live in. So back to the 12 tribes. Now, in this chapter of Revelation list, two tribes are missing, Dan and Ephraim. However, Dan is now replaced by the Levites. The Le Levi is included. And Ephraim is replaced by his father, the name of Joseph, listed over here. We think it is because Dan and Ephraim both went into slave uh, idolatry 
in a major way in the Old Testament and were excluded as tribe. As for the different order of the list, the, the Old Testament itself even have 19 different orders of the 12 tribes based on their different contexts. And this order in Revelation is different from all the 19 Old Testament orders. Well, God knows the reason why. He's, he selected which tribe, their order, and even the exact number of people from its tribe. Even today, the Jews could not be sure about their own tribal distinctions, but God could. We must allow God to have His unrevealed secrets in the Bible. However, one very clear truth we can have it's that God is not yet through with the Jews. In Romans chapters 9 to 11, the Apostle Paul affirms in three chapters of the New Testament that God will fulfill His promises to Israel because God's reputation is at stake. What reputation? Well, in the Old Testament, God had promised the physical descendants of Abraham five major biblical covenants. Four covenants are unconditional. They will be fulfilled regardless. And one, only one con covenant is conditional. As follows. In the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, God promises to bless Abraham's descendants unconditional. Secondly, in the Palestinian covenant, Genesis 13, God promised the promised land of Canaan or Palestine today to the Jews, also unconditional. Thirdly, in the Mosaic covenant, the only conditional covenant, God promised to bless his people if they obey the law as given at Mount Sinai. Fourth, the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised them an eternal king from the line of David, fulfilled now in Jesus Christ from the lineage of David. That is unconditional. Finally, the fifth covenant it's the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. God promises to give them a new heart, fulfilled at the future millennium. That's unconditional. Now let's go on the ministry of 144,000 evangelists. Our text does not detail the ministry of this Witnesses. However, with the immediately following redeemed multitudes right in the same chapter here, we conclude that they, the, those multitudes, were the harvest of the 144,000 who went around the world and preached to all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. In fact, Jesus himself in Matthew 24, 14, see above scripture in our chart here, says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, of course, is that possible with today's uh, worldwide air transportation network, it is more than possible to travel around the world several times. Some years ago, one day, I received a letter from American Airlines congratulating me on reaching the one million mile flying record. I was surprised to have 
flown so much on Jet Start Airline. So I called AA in Dallas, and it was confirmed. Then I remembered that it was about 30 years ago that I was flying almost every week on Bible prophecy teaching worldwide. It took me 30 years to reach 1 million miles. Of course, I also used other airlines. But imagine those 144,000 evangelists could easily become million milers on several airlines in only three years, not 30 years. And, that, and they don't have to worry about getting any virus or pestilence of any kind. They could tirelessly go preach the gospel day and night around the world from the Arctic to the Antarctic, reaching every tribe, people, country, and nations for Christ. But wait a minute. How could the 144,000 witnesses learn to speak so many languages in a short three and a half years of the tribulation? Because the next verse told us in verse 9 that they reach all tongues. Well, here are at least three possibilities. First, the 144,000 witnesses will have the Spirit given Pentecostal power and speech. It's like during the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. They could speak foreign languages without learning them. Given by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of the listeners to immediately understand what they heard right away, even with limited verbal communication and limited time to do it. Thirdly, I read about the Google Translate app. The Google promotion says you can speak or type in one language and the app will transcribe what you say into another language immediately. Just tap the microphone icon at the top of the screen and speak your word or phrase into the app. Google Translate will translate your words into the target language. Here is the picture to, the, to your right are two foreigners conversing with each other easily in their own languages and yet simultaneously being translated. Notice the picture to the left. This person is using his or her mobile phone to just take a picture of a foreign signboard or menu and immediately got it translated right on his phone. Today, Google Translate app has 500 million users and in 103 languages. Amazing. Dear brothers and sisters and friends, with modern technology and gadgets, the rapture now could happen anytime, and the 144,000 could go and reach the word with the gospel within the three and a half years of the tribulation, as the Bible predicted. But we don't have to wait for them to reach the world. Today, you and I can be pre-144,000 witnesses of the gospel to the entire world. In fact, Christ already gave us the Great Commission 2,000 years ago in Matthew 28, 19 and Mark 16, 15, saying, Go ye into all the world and teach all creatures or nations. God the Father desires all the world to have a last chance to hear the gospel story and make the personal decision for salvation in Christ. God the Son, Jesus Christ, desires 
for heaven to be populated forever with representatives of all people groups in heaven to forever eternally witness of his sacrifice on the cross for us. Let's go to the second group in verses 9 to 17, the redeemed multitudes, the great multitudes saved on earth, now in heaven. Suddenly, the scene changes from earth to heaven. John reports seeing a great multitude from all nations standing before the throne, waving victory palm branches. Let's look at their origin in verse 9. Verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. The worldwide preaching by fearless and invincible 144,000 preachers had resulted in uncounted multitudes safe around the world. But perhaps that would not have been enough to spread the good news to the 7.8 billion people on earth today. There are at least three possibilities. First, the 144,000 evangelists had perhaps briefly taught the gospel message as they had to move on fast. But the Holy Spirit continued to convict the people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. John 16, 8. Number two possibility. These people, the great multitude, were surely touched by having seen millions and millions of Christians suddenly disappeared at the rapture from earth, and their consensus was that all were Christians. Thirdly, this great multitude had already gone through the six seals judgments. They had seen the hand of God in judgment for all the ungodly. And so now they had gladly trusted Jesus as their personal Savior. The Bible says, Of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, Every nation, every kind, every language would be represented before the throne of God. While on earth, these nations and people had to be separated apart from each other, and perhaps there were no peace among them. Now in Christ, they are brought together in unity, peace, and worship before the throne and before the Lamb of God. And here, at the middle of the tribulation, these new believers in Christ were martyred and in heaven. But note, not all believers during the tribulation would be martyred. Many would be able to escape the Antichrist worldwide control by living very simply, avoiding capture, and yet maintain a witness for Christ without the mark of the beast. If they die, they immediately go to heaven, like what we are seeing here. But if they survive, they would enter the millennial kingdom with Christ reigning a thousand years, one thousand years on earth. In fact, Matthew chapter 25 tells the parable of the sheep and goats with Jesus saying to the sheep, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus is talking to them, the survivals, 
of this tribulation still on earth. The believers in Christ who survive the tribulation are the sheep in Jesus' parable. They will be the first generation, the first generation of millennial people. We shall study the millennium in Revelation chapter 20. Let's go on. Their salvation song in verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. This great multitude redeemed in heaven is singing a song with a loud voice saying, Salvation, Salvation. Notice the major thanksgiving theme of all saints, all the saints in heaven is salvation in Christ. The common theme of all the redeemed in heaven forever is salvation in Jesus Christ. Everyone in heaven, in fact, is there because they were saved by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And dear brethren, if we will be singing about salvation forever someday in glory, why not get into practice now? Shout it, tell it, show it to your friends, family, and the world that you are saved and how to be saved by trusting in Jesus Christ. When I was pastor of Grace Christian Church in the Philippines, we built a big church seating 1,500 members inside Grace Village. I told the architect Felipe Mendoza to be sure to place two words on top of the massive cross outside the church. He asked, what two words? It's Jesus saves. And there it is. Jesus saves. For 45 long years now, proclaiming salvation in Christ. Praise the Lord. Now let's see the angel's response. Angelic response in verses 11 to 12 to the multitude's song. Verse 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four living creatures and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Wow! The response from all the angels is overwhelming. The angels are so thrilled to see this redeemed multitude arriving in heaven from earth. Everyone, including the four living creatures and 24 elders before God's throne, now fell on their faces in praise and worship before God. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Here is a sevenfold doxology of praise, beginning and ending with the word Amen and Amen. Amen is, may it be so, so be it. And every word linked with the word N, A N D. Seven majestic words are linked together with the conjunction N. So meaningful. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. How wonderful. How meaningful. In Luke chapter 15, verses 7 and 10, Jesus said that when one lost person on earth is saved, all of heaven breaks out in a joyful chorus of praise. Jesus said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented. Just one. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over just one sinner that repented. 
said Jesus. Imagine, if one sinner is saved, it produces special joy in heaven. How much more when this multitude of redeemed Gentiles entering heaven was in the blood of Christ. Heaven would be especially aglow with great joy. Now let us digress and see what's happening on earth, on the earth. At that time, at this time, the Antichrist has transformed himself from a mouse into a lion on earth. He has won the mid-tribulational war, which, he had, which we have described in the last session. And he breaks the peace treaty with Israel. The Antichrist enters the Jerusalem temple and proclaims himself king of the world. And for the next three and a half years, the Antichrist uses military, economic, and other power with the number 666 to rule the world. Notice the difference. While at the same time in heaven, all the angels and the saints are bowing down to God Almighty and the Lamb. There on earth, all earth dwellers are bowing down to the Antichrist, the false prophet, and to Satan. Yet there is a difference. In heaven it is forever. There on earth it is for three and a half years. When Christ and the saints will go down to bind Satan for a thousand years and throw Antichrist into the lake of fire and establish his thousand-year millennium on earth, followed by eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. Now let's get back to heaven. In verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? It is surprising that one of the elders gave the answer even though no one was asking him. And yet that's exactly what an elder on earth should do. A mature brother or sister is supposed to do, to give spiritual advice and answer, even though no one is asking. Verse 14 says, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. John does not recognize who they were. He did not know them. John the apostle, the disciple, that means they were not the church. Otherwise, John would have recognized them. This is a different group which have, we have mentioned, which have come up to heaven. They are called tribulational saints, not church age saints. However, both groups, the church age and tribulation saints, are saved the same way, through faith in the saving work of Christ on the cross. The elder told John that this uncounted multitude came out of great, great tribulation. Now, the tribulation is divided into two parts. The first three and a half years is called tribulation, or the beginning of sorrows. The second three and a half years is called the great tribulation, due to the severity of its judgments. The seven seals occurred at the first half of the tribulation, but the seventh seal, the last seal, opened the next half of the tribulation, which would be the seven trumpet judgments, or the second, seven half, second half, which would be followed for several months, just a few months, with the seven bowl judgments at the end. 
So these great multitudes were safe at the start of the seal judgments. Under the super church or the world church at that time, the first half. And they came out or they were killed at the second half at the trumpet judgments under the Antichrist. The Bible says they have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb of God. They have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Notice that everyone in heaven there is there not because of their good works but because or because they deserve it, but simply because of their faith in the saving work of the Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Let's go on their heavenly services now in heaven. Verse 4, 15. Verse 15. The great multitudes. Verse 15. Therefore, are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. John gave a beautiful description of these people. First, they were fully accepted, for they stood before God's throne and the Lamb. No doubt they had been rejected on earth, for they had stood for truth at a time when lies and partial truth were popular and Satan was in charge. Secondly, they are now joyful in heaven. They sing praises to the Father and to the Lamb, joined by all the angels who surrounded the throne. Thirdly, they are now rewarded. They had the privilege of being before the throne day and night and serving Him. When God's people get to heaven, a major part of their reward is to continue serving God. They have work to do, work without toil and tears. That is their reward, forever joyful in the service of the King, of the Almighty King. Verse 16 Earth's toils and tears Verse 16 says, The elder says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. This tribulation sense they had refused to take the mark of the beast. They had rejected the Antichrist and the false prophet, the world and their carnal nature. They had repented of their sins and they had remained loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because of their faith in the Lord and their reject him, rejection of the Antichrist and the world, they they were not able to buy or sell goods on earth. They had lost their jobs, credit, and cash. In this digital world, it's easy to determine who are Christians. They could not be able to go to stores to buy food and drink. They suffered hunger because of it. Many, many will starve to death. They were pushed away from their homes on the run for their lives, without shelter and safety, under the heat of the sun, and many died because of it. But wait a minute, how did this elder in heaven know all about these things happening on earth? The elder seems to know all the details of the great multitude on earth, how they had suffered, what kind of suffering, and how they had endured. But if those in heaven know about what's happening on earth, would they still be happy in heaven? That's our question. 
And the answer is, those in heaven are already experiencing immortality. They have heavenly perspective on all that's happening on earth. They are fully aware that God is still in control, in full control. They know that trials and sufferings on earth are ways to test and to mature believers to faith and more faith and to trust and more trust in their God. And they also know that eternal rewards, they see it in heaven, these 24 elders, eternal rewards are earned through suffering and testing on earth. That's the heavenly perspective. In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, God gives us an honor role of the heroes of faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. And then comes to the wonderful climax in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us then run with patience the race that is set before us. Here's the secret, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto only one, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. The argument of this verse is this. Since the grandstand of heaven is filled with so many eager observers or witnesses of how we run. We should lay aside every sin and look unto Jesus only to complete our rest on earth. Jesus will give us power to do his work while heaven is our unseen, invisible, cheering squad hoping and cheering we run the rest well on earth. Yes, in heaven, they know what we do here on earth. They know it. And if you want to make people in heaven rejoice, then today trust only in Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And then run with patience the rest that is set before you. In verse 17, no more tears. Verse 17, for the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The Lamb has now become the Shepherd. Christ will lead them beside still waters, to living waters, to fountains of waters. They need no longer thirst. The living water will satisfy their thirst forever and ever. The good shepherd had laid down, he has laid down his life for the sheep. He knows how to give abundant life to the sheep. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God himself shall do it. We know life has given us many tears. I am 82. Praise God for a life of ministry in Christ. Many joys and yet also tears. But there will come a day someday in heaven, when our Lord himself will explain every teardrop to us, wipe away all tears from our eyes. Every tear turns into a pearl. He will take every hurt and transport it into a hallelujah. Now, this tribulation 
sins had endured the worst, the world had to give them. Now they will enjoy the best that God has to offer them. They will receive the royal treatment in heaven. These people have been saved. Now they will serve and they will be supplied with all that they need and want. And today, dear brothers and sisters, friends, we must always remember that Christians, when we are Christians, we are the people of God. We have been saved by grace, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are daily supplied by the Lord, and we can rejoice today in the God of our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 promises about this. We had studied how God had sent his strong angel to seal and protect the 144,000 evangelists. Let me assure you, dear brothers and sisters, that today God's people, you and I, are already sealed by the Holy Spirit. All Christians today are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the moment, the moment they trusted Christ as Savior. Ephesians 1.13 says, When ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise or as promised. This means we belong to Jesus and we are under his care. As long as we are in God's will, no one, no, nothing can touch us. We are in Christ's hands and the almighty God's arms are wrapped around us. The Bible says underneath are the everlasting arms. This is God's guarantee that we are safe and safely protected for life and eternity. And when God's time comes, He will one day take us to, a, to heaven. Maybe some of you may say, Oh, I can wait until after the rapture and then believe someday at the tribulation and still get to heaven. Precious friends, please understand that these great multitudes we have just studied are not the church. They are tribulational saints. Believers now are in the church age. They are the bride of Christ. Someday we will be seated on the throne, wearing crowns and are kings and priests before God. All because of Jesus Christ. Who died for us. The tribulational saints are in front of the throne, waving palm branches, serving the Lord day and night. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now, trust in Christ, be part of the bride of Christ in the church age. Take a minute, a few minutes, to pause and pray. Make life-changing commitment with God. Mankind has a big problem, the problem of sin on the left. And the penalty of sin is death, eternal death. However, Jesus already paid the penalty of sin by dying on the cross for you and me. And when we just turn and trust in Him, we are transported immediately to the other side of the problem. It's full of God's promises to give us eternal life right away. Now we can know it. And it's not to condemn and judge us. And we have passed from death unto life says the Bible. Actually, that is God's original purpose to bless you today. If you just accept 
his love and offer of salvation. Shall we bow in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we could have together around thy holy word. You have told us many things about the future. In these uncertain and dark days, may our hearts turn to thee in faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we accept thee as our personal Savior, friend, and shepherd into the future. And because we trust thee, Lord, may thy Holy Spirit anoint our hearts even today with joy, peace, and hope. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Jesus loves you.